next lecture about quantum groups. So uh, I think we've been doing too much theoretical stuff, so I want to do some computations today, some simple computations, uh, so that we, which uh, will uh, uh, help us uh, get a feel of how things work. So we will talk about uh, uh, finite dimensional representations of quantum affine algebra UQ of SL2 hat. So let us recall the definition of this algebra. So, so it is generated by uh, uh, e, uh, uh, I, uh, F I and H, uh, K I, uh, plus minus one, uh, where I is zero or one. So, so what is the Cartan matrix of this algebra? It is two minus two minus two, two. So the, there are uh, uh, zero, uh, E zero and E one. Uh, and uh, there are these generators, and uh, then there are uh, these relations. So they satisfy SL2 relations for each i. And also we have uh, K0 commutes with K1. And uh, uh, E0 commutes with F1. And then uh, uh, there are relations how k uh, commutes. So for example, k0 e1 k0 inverse equals to q to the minus 2 e1. So this is uh, this minus 2. And similarly, k1 e0 k1 inverse equals to q uh, to the minus 2 e0. And there are symmetrical relations for F1. So K0, F1, K0 inverse equals Q squared F1. And K1, F0, K1 inverse equals to Q to the minus 2 F0, uh, Q to squared F0. Uh, and then there are SER relations. Uh, so SER relation looks like this. E, uh, so if your I is different from J, uh, then uh, equal to 0 or 1. Uh, then E i cubed E j uh, minus Q analog of 3, which is uh, Q squared plus 1 plus Q to the minus 2, uh, times E i squared E j E i uh, plus, uh, again, Q analog of 3, so Q squared plus 1 plus Q to the minus 2 uh, E uh, i E j E i squared. Uh, minus uh, e uh, j e i cubed equals to zero, a and the same for f i. And uh, so, uh, in uh, for q equals to one, I remind you how this is related to the loop representation. So uh, um, uh, e uh, i e, uh, e, e one equal e. F, uh, so, so we get uh, loops uh, of SL2 uh, maps from the C star to SL2. So F1 equal F, uh, uh, H1 is H, and then um, uh, uh, E0 is F times T, which where T is the parameter on C star. Uh, F0 equals to E times T inverse. And H0 equals to uh, uh, the central element minus H. So the central element is equal to H0 plus H1. And, this is the, and then we are quantizing this story here. So in particular, uh, K0 times K1, which is uh, capital C, is a central element. And similarly to what we said uh, last time, that uh, this little c acts by 0 in finite dimensional representations, this is going to act by 1 in finite dimensional representation. So acts by 1 in finite dimensional representation. And there are some formulas for coproduct, which are just come from SL2, so I'm not going to remind them. So now uh, let us uh, look. Uh, so how can we construct representations of this huge algebra? Well, luckily, uh, in this case, it is pretty simple uh, because uh, so finite dimensional representations. So uh, we have actually evaluation homomorphism. Uh, 
uh, uh, which uh, I will denote by uh, uh, phi, and it goes from uq of SL2 hat to uq of SL2. And it acts by a very simple formula. Phi of EI is E, phi of FI is F, and uh, phi of uh, uh, KI, uh, sorry, phi of, uh, no, that's not correct. Uh, So phi of e, uh, e, E1 equals to phi of F0 equals to E, phi of F1 equals to phi of E0 equals to F, and finally phi of K1 equals to phi of K0 inverse equals to K. Uh, so this is uh, literally uh, uh, the uh, generalization of uh, uh, the valuation homomorphism here, which just sets t to 1. And actually, it turns out that the same formulas without any change work in the uh, quantum case. And uh, in fact, we not only have this evaluation homomorphism, but we have a whole one parameter family of them corresponding to uh, uh, non zero complex numbers, which correspond to evaluation of t not at 1, but at another point. Uh, because we have actually uh, a C star action on this thing. This is a graded uh, Hopf algebra. So we have a C star action. So let me call it tau sub z. And it, um, it acts uh, just by scaling this t. So uh, it will multiply E0 by z. And it will multiply F0 by z inverse. And uh, uh, then it acts trivially on other generators. And then what we can do is we can compose phi with this tau z. So I would denote by phi sub z is phi composed with tau uh, z. So this is an evaluation homomorphism from uq of SL2 hat to uq of SL2. And we have a, uh, this gives us a whole family of such homomorphisms, parameterized by points of C star. So now, uh, 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 it's very good because uh, we know a lot about representation theory of UQ of SL2. So we can uh, pull back representations from UQ of SL2 to UQ of SL2 hat. So this will be called evaluation representations. And then uh, we can uh, tensor them together, but already as representations of quantum SL2 hat. And this will give us a, a rich family of representations. It turns out that it gives all irreducible finite dimensional representations. So let's do this. So uh, well, what is the, uh, the simplest representation? Is the two-dimensional representation, V equals to C2. So this is the two-dimensional representation of quantum SL2. And this representation is given by extremely simple formulas. In fact, by the same, uh, essentially the same formulas as the, uh, for Q equals 1. So E goes to 0, 1, 0, 0. F goes to 0, 0, 0, 1. And uh, K, K, go, K is Q to the H, so it should go to Q, 0, 0, Q inverse. So it's literally the same uh, representation as usual. If you go to higher dimensional, then the formulas will be a little different from the classical case. But for two-dimensional representation, it is exactly the same. And, uh, and therefore, we have representation. Uh, so, so let us denote, so, so if you have some finite uh, dimensional representation, uh, uh, we will denote by V of Z, which is evaluation of V at a point Z. So this is going to be a representation of quantum affine algebra, so pi V of Z of A is going to be pi V of phi Z of A. So we first should apply this tau Z and then phi. So, uh, so if you compute uh, what it looks like, then you will uh, get the following formulas. Uh, so E1 go still goes to 0, 1, 0, 0. 
uh, F1 go still goes to 0, 0, 1, 0. Uh, K1 still goes to uh, Q, 0, 0, Q inverse. Uh, but E0, well, E0, remember, A, E0 is uh, 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 under this map goes to uh, F, but, uh, but it multiplies by Z. So it goes to ZF, so, so you'll get 0, 0, Z, 0. And similarly, F0 goes to 0, Z inverse, 0, 0. And K0 goes to the inverse of this, which is Q inverse, 0, 0, Q. OK, so now what I want to do is I want to compute the dual of this representation. So let's compute the dual, V of Z dual. Uh, well. Uh, so as represent so uh, 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 ah but uh, so it's pretty clear so it's easy to show that any two dimensional irreducible representation uh, is going to be a, a v of z for some z so this is going to be a, a isomorphic to v of w for some w uh, so let us compute this w assuming I'm not going to show that this is uh, the case actually it's easy to show directly. But let's, uh, let's see uh, what this W is. So how can we recognize Z from V of Z? Well, uh, look, so we have this uh, E1, which is this matrix, and E0, which is this matrix. So if you take their product, it's going to have eigenvalue Z. It will have two eigenvalues, 0 and Z. So, uh, so Z is, uh, if you like, it's the trace of E0, E1. Uh, so, uh, so let's compute, uh, uh, so what is E0, uh, E1 or, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the dual space? So of, on V of Z dual, uh, uh, so uh, pi V of Z dual of E0 should be uh, pi of uh, uh, V of Z, but here we should use the antipode of E0. And the antipode of E0, as you remember, is equal to minus E0 times K0 inverse. So what we get is uh, minus E0, K0 inverse dual. Uh, and similarly, pi V of Z dual of F0 uh, of uh, E1 is uh, minus uh, E1, K1 inverse dual. So what we get uh, if we multiply things is uh, so uh, so W is going to be the trace of the product of those two things. So this is going to be the trace of uh, 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 E1 times K1 inverse E0 times K0 inverse. Uh, but then we have to switch. So this is going to be the trace of E1 uh, and K1 inverse. So K1 with E0 uh, gives you Q to the minus 2. So K1 inverse with E0 will give us Q squared. And we will get uh, E1, E0. Uh, K1 times K0 is 1 uh, because it is this element C. So we will get Q squared times the trace of uh, uh, E1, E0 which is uh, Q squared Z. So, so this is what we get, W equals to Q squared Z. So the result is that V uh, uh, of Z star is equal to V of Q squared Z. But then uh, if we take the double dual, for example, V of Z double star, well, we should do it twice. So this is going to be V of Q to the fourth Z. So you see, the, uh, this is an example of the Hopf algebra where uh, uh, taking double dual is not a uh, 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 trivial operation, even at the level of simple object of this category. So square of the antipode is not only not the identity here, but also it's not an inner automorphism. In fact, this, uh, it is uh, expressed in terms of this tau for z equals to q to the fourth. And uh, let me make a remark that uh, the last, uh, so, this, uh, uh, so, uh, so this equation star holds for any representation of UQ of 
uh, SL2 hat, finite dimensional representation. Not necessarily reducible, not necessarily two dimensional. And also uh, for uh, any finite dimensional Lie algebra, uh, um, for any representation, you will have the following uh, rule. So V of Z double star is going to be V of uh, Z times Q to the twice dual Coxter number. Okay, so this uh, means in particular that uh, we have uh, uh, that the tensor, uh, so, so this implies that if you take the tensor product uh, V of Z tensored with uh, V of uh, Q squared Z, then it is going to be reducible because it is the same as V of Z tensored with V of Z dual. And we have a map from C to here, which uh, is the uh, uh, co-evaluation map. And in a similar way, uh, if you take V of Z tensored V of Q to the minus 2Z, then this is also reducible because this is V of Q to the minus 2Z dual tensor V Q to the minus 2Z. And this uh, doesn't receive a map from here, but, uh, but it maps to C by the evaluation map. So if you can check. Uh, an exercise. Yeah, uh, yes, so this category is not semi-simple. And uh, what you uh, can show is that there is an exercise that you have short exact sequences. So if you take this V of Z, maybe I write it uh, here. Uh, uh, so, so if you have uh, V of Z tensored with V of Q squared Z, uh, then, uh, well, as I said, it has a copy of C, and the quotient is uh, 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 W of QZ, where W is the three-dimensional irreducible representation of uh, quantum SL2. And in a similar way, the dual sequence looks like this. So zero goes to W of, uh, so here it's going to be Q, uh, uh, Q inverse Z goes to uh, V of uh, Q uh, of Z tensored with V Q inverse, uh, v tensored with V Q to the minus 2 Z and uh, goes to uh, C goes to zero. And these sequences are not split. And so in particular, uh, you see that uh, this category cannot be braided because uh, uh, x cross y is not always isomorphic to y cross x. But uh, you see that even though they are not isomorphic, they always have the same composition series. So if you uh, switch the order, you will get, uh, well, things will get shifted by q square. So this tensor product and the opposite tensor product have the same composition factors, which is the C and W of QZ, but uh, depending on the order, they occur uh, in different uh, uh, orders. So one is a sub and the other is a quotient or the other way. And uh, mm, uh, so the claim, which you can also check by direct calculation, is that if you have V of Z and you tensor it with V of U for any U, then this is irreducible except those two points, uh, u over z equals to q squared or q to the minus 2. And uh, in this situation, it is not surprising that uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, v of z tensored with v of u is actually isomorphic v of u tensored with v of z when, uh, when they are uh, away from these points. In fact, the isomorphism between them uh, is going to be given by the R matrix, which I will discuss later. And in this situation, it is not surprising that uh, the composition series of the two products, when they are not the same, turned out to be the same. Because uh, it is a general fact. If you have a family of uh, algebras, 
uh, uh, flat family of, uh, let's say, finite dimensional algebras, and you have a flat family of modules. And uh, generically, uh, you, ha you have some isomorphism which has a pole at one point. Uh, then uh, at that point, the fibers don't have to be isomorphic, but uh, they have to have the same composition series. Uh, so, so this is a general fact. If you take a tensor product of any number of uh, uh, evaluation representations, it may be reducible and it may uh, depend on the order, but the composition series never depends on the order. So uh, this will imply that the growth in decreeing is always commutative. Uh, yeah, yeah, before quantization, it was irreducible when the points were different, when u over z was not equal to 1. But when you quantize the point where they reducible, it doubles up. It, and so now we have two points. And it's reducible in a different way in those two points. So that's why I said that things will get more exciting. Yes. Ah, this is, uh, you, you, you have to check. Uh, it's a three-dimensional three irreducible, so all three-dimensional irreducibles are W of something. So this is, I, I, you, you, you can check it. In fact, it will become more clear from the discussion later. Other questions? For, so this is not conformal field theory. There is nothing conformally invariant here. Remember, we, uh, so there is a, you, you see that we have the C star and we have multiplication by Q squared, so this transformation is not conformally invariant. This is not about conformal field theory. Quantum affine algebras do not have conformal symmetry. It's a massive, they correspond to massive field theory. Yeah, there is also uh, there is also a version uh, for elliptic curves. Yeah, you can write elliptic curve, and you can talk, so this will be related. You can relate it to uh, this theory to uh, some uh, geometry uh, related to that elliptic curve, but that's not going to be conformal field theory. So it's a Q deformation of conformal field theory. Okay, so the so we uh, so we have this uh, this picture here, and. Uh, uh, so, so now I, I want to discuss the general classification of irreducible representations uh, uh, of this algebra due to Chari and Presley. Oh, this is the wrong thing. So uh, so, uh, so let's say uh, for a in uh, z greater or equal to 0, v a will be the irreducible representation of uh, uq of SL2 with highest weight a. So I'm talking about generic q. q is not the root of unity. And so, uh, so then we have representation v a of z and then we can uh, define products so you, you take, take v a 1 of z 1 
tensor product V A N of Z N. And then we might wonder when is it irreducible? So I gave you the answer in the case when we have just two factors and both are two dimensional. So it turns out that this has a very nice answer. So uh, 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 so theorem of Chari and Presley so and to state this theorem I need uh, uh, um, I need a definition so uh, so a string in uh, C star is a geometric progression finite geometric progression with the uh, uh, um, factor Q square. So this means uh, you have some numbers uh, B, uh, Q squared times B, Q to the fourth times B, and so on. Q to the 2M times B. So that's what the string is. So you can think of it as a sequence like this in logarithmic coordinates. Uh, and uh, uh, then the uh, definition is the following. Two strings, S and T, are uh, in special position if the union, S union T, is a string well, they, they may intersect, and so you just take union as a set, and this is supposed to be a string. And moreover, it containing S and T properly. So it is not allowed. So union is a string, and also neither S is contained in T nor T is contained in S. And uh, uh, Chari and Presley uh, uh, theorem is the following. So you let us attach. So to V A of Z, we are going to attach its string. Its string, which I will call. Uh, okay, so let me do it here. So to VA of Z, I can attach uh, a string which I will call SA of Z. And this is the following string. Uh, so it's going to start with Q to the uh, minus A minus 1 Z. Then it goes to go with step 2, minus A minus 3 Z. And all the way to Q to the A minus 1 Z. So this is a string of length A. So for the trivial representation, you have empty string. And for uh, repre one dimensional representation, so for example, for V of Z, where V is two dimensional, uh, we get the spectrum S1. Uh, we get the string S1 of Z, which is just uh, Z. to Q squared, Q squared. So it is centered at Z, and it uh, has step Q squared and uh, length A. Uh, by, by length, I mean the number of points. So is this already eigenvalues of something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will get to that. They are going to be eigenvalues of something. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, uh, and the theorem of Chari and Presley is that this tensor product, so this is number one, this tensor product is irreducible if and only if uh, 
So we say this is special position, but otherwise we will say the general position. Otherwise, they're in general position. And then uh, this is if and only if the strings S A I of Z I are pairwise in general position. This is the first statement. The second statement is that such tensor product, such irreducible tensor products are isomorphic if and only if they differ by permutation. And the third statement is any irreducible finite dimensional representation is uh, isomorphic to, to such a product. So this you gives you a complete story. And of course, uh, it's not clear, for example, right away why uh, if they differ by permutation, then they have to be isomorphic. That turns out to be because we have some R matrices that I will talk about later. So nothing here is uh, for free. It's a non-trivial theorem. But of course, by uh, uh, now, uh, uh, the, this subject is so developed that this, this theorem is rather easy. Uh, OK, and so. Uh, uh, and then uh, maybe I should uh, give a lemma. That, uh, so, well, so therefore, uh, representations are parameterized by such products. But in fact, you can state uh, the set. You, you can uh, the set parameterizing a reducible representation can be described in a much simpler way using the following lemma, which actually uh, is quite suggestive of what the general answer might be. So, uh, for for higher rank Lie algebra. So the lemma says the following, that uh, any, uh, any finite set in C star with multiplicities is uh, 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 uniquely, can be uniquely represented as a, a, a union uh, 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 as a disjoint union, well, as a union of uh, strings pairwise in general position. Yeah, maybe here. Strings uh, pairwise in general position. So this is a combinatorial lemma, which is an exercise. It's pretty easy. So, uh, so let me give you some examples to give you a feel of how this works. OK. Mm So here is an example. So suppose you have, uh, uh, let's say, a set like this. And then you're going to have twice this point, and then uh, three times this point, and then this point. So how to write this as a union of strings in general position? Well, uh, so we have to, uh, so, th uh, this is a, so there is a string uh, of five, like this, uh, and also a string of uh, two, like this, and also a string of one, like this. And they have pairwise in general position. Because uh, even though they intersect, but any two, that, uh, so any two of them intersect, but one contains the other, so they're in general position. And if we had something like this, for example, 
uh, let's say we have two of these. Well, yeah, they organize themselves this uh, into some kind of tree, yeah, and so so this is like, well, we have this thing, and then we have this thing, and then we have this. Thing. Okay, so these are examples, uh, and uh, uh, so this means that uh, uh, finite dimensional irreducible representations. Are uh, parameterized by uh, finite subsets uh, of uh, C star uh, uh, with multiplicities which is the same as to say polynomials with constant term one. Because if you have a polynomial with constant term one, it has roots, which uh, gives you a set of multiplicities in C star. And conversely, if you have a, uh, uh, a set with multiplicities in C star, you can write the corresponding product, which will be a polynomial with constant term one. So these are called Drinfeld polynomials, and they are going to arise in a natural way in the next discussion. So let's talk about uh, uh, permuting factors. So permuting factor comes from R matrices. Uh, uh, so uh, well, uh, so certainly this quantum of fine algebra UQ of SL2 hat uh, has a universal R matrix, which we discussed. which is a kind of infinite sum of things like AI times e AI star, and so there are nicer, more explicit formulas. But that's a huge, huge sum, infinite sum. And therefore, if uh, you have uh, V and W, two finite dimensional representations, then certainly the restriction to V tensor W uh, by itself uh, doesn't make much sense. But we can consider, uh, we can apply this tau Z which is uh, the symmetry uh, to the first component of R. Remember that the first component of R has positive weight uh, with respect to this degree. And the, neg the second, because it was made out of UQ of B plus, and this has negative weights. Uh, well, there are some zero weights too, but the part of zero weight uh, is going to be finite because uh, this would be the R matrix of the finite dimensional quantum group, and we know that that makes perfect sense in finite dimensional representations. So if you restrict that on V tensor W, this is a power series in Z. Uh, so, so this is going to lie in endomorphisms of V tensor W, formal power series of Z. So it makes sense at least as that which ca we can think of as R restricted to the V of Z tensor W. So we can't make sense of the action of R on V tensor W, but we can make sense in this formal sense uh, of action of R on V of Z tensor W. Now, a theorem of Drinfeld Not, no, not really. I mean, uh, well, in fact, it, it will turn out that for some V and W, if you just think about it as a numerical series with values and matrices, uh, we, we think about uh, just series with values and matrices, it will converge. But, uh, but, but it's better to think about this this way. So, so the theorem of Drinfeld says that <laughs> UQ of SL2 hat, yes. UQ of SL2 would be no problem. It makes sense because it is an infinite sum, but is act nilpotently, 
and therefore the sum terminates. But here, uh, the E's don't act nilpotently because remember, what are the, the e, uh, e zero? Uh, so, so there is a, for example, uh, so we have, uh, uh, if you commute E zero with E one, uh, this is like uh, H times T in the classical algebra, and that doesn't act nilpotently. So, uh, so we will not get a reasonable expression. Now, the theorem of Drinfeld says that this uh, series uh, uh, converges uh, for absolute value of z less than uh, some r, for some r. So here, you, you actually need some complex analysis. So it converges uh, in this disk. And also, uh, uh, and, uh, if uh, v and w are irreducible, Then, uh, 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 so, so, so I'm going to call this R of Z, R V W of Z. Then R V W of Z equals to R bar V W of Z times uh, uh, F V W of Z, where uh, R bar is a rational function. And uh, uh, f is a, 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 a scalar function. So it's not rational. Actually, f is a holomorphic, meromorphic function. So it's a scalar uh, meromorphic function. It extends meromorphically to the whole complex plane, but with infinitely many zeros and poles. In fact, it is a certain product. What? what? Yeah, it is some kind of gamma function. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, uh, so uh, uh, how is this proved? Well, you prove that this thing satisfies, or is some, uh, 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 this fact that uh, uh, V double star of Z equals to V of uh, Q to the fourth Z, it uh, uh, gives rise to a, a certain difference equation, nonlinear difference equation on this R. And then you can prove that that nonlinear difference equation has a holomorphic solution. Yeah, no, it follows, uh, so, so the fact that it is rational, the, that the matrix part is rational, follows from the fact that this tensor product uh, is uh, uh, irreducible for generic Z. Yeah. That's not clear. So if you have a series where, where the, all the terms are determined uniquely by the first five terms, why is it a rational function? No, but the equation, so you have an equation in, 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 in two variables. Yeah. But there are, uh, well, OK. Well, so maybe this is more or less the same what, I'm, uh, what I want to say, that it's a, uh, 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 but, but that you have to use irreducibility of V and W, because if uh, V and W are not irreducible, you don't have such a simple factorization. And this thing also becomes a matrix. And actually, this thing is very important. It gives rise to so-called elliptic central character. So if you, it satisfies a linear difference equation. And if you compute the connection matrix for this difference equation, it's a certain elliptic function. And it tells you about blocks in this category, which was done in my paper with uh, Adriana Mora like 15 years ago. So, but but my, my argument was that uh, if uh, V and, uh, and W are irreducible, then the tensor product is generically irreducible. You can show that by just deformation argument from, uh, finite, uh, from the usual affine algebra. 
And uh, this means that uh, uh, indeed we have uh, just a, a system of linear equations, like you said, uh, with rational coefficients. And so uh, for intertwining operator, uh, and it has a solution of a power series, and therefore it must have a solution of a function, of a rational function. Yeah, so this is how, but you have to use the reducibility. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, the fact that this is convergent follows from this, uh, so there is this crossing symmetry which tells you that V double dual is V of Q to the fourth, and uh, this gives rise to a difference equation, and you can prove uh, uh, by doing some simple complex analysis that, uh, uh, by doing some not very complex complex analysis, uh, that this uh, has a holomorphic solution. Yeah. No, it's not a real complex analysis. <laughs> real complex analysis is not simple. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, so, so you, 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 you prove this theorem. Uh, and uh, so in part, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then this R bar can be chosen in such a way that R bar uh, is uh, 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 it satisfies the unitarity condition. So R of Z times R bar uh, of, uh, R, of R bar of Z times R bar to one of Z inverse equals to one. So this rational function, not the universal R matrix, but the rational function satisfies this equation. So, so, uh, so this is uh, uh, m like uh, mock symmetric braiding, symmetric uh, br braiding. But it is a mock symmetric braiding because it's not even a braiding. We we saw that uh, uh, this thing has poles. So, so let's do an example. How does this thing look like uh, uh, for uh, v? Uh, equal to, uh, to W equal to the two-dimensional representation. So then the formula is the following. Uh, R of Z. So this is going to be a four by four matrix with respect to the standard basis. Uh, uh, so this is going to be, uh, so we have a basis. Uh, C2 has a basis V plus and V minus. And so C2 cross C2 has a basis V plus cross V plus, et cetera. So I will denote just, just plus plus. So this is going to be plus plus, plus minus, minus plus, and minus minus. And similarly here, plus plus, plus minus, minus plus, and minus minus. And the matrix looks as follows. Maybe this is too small. Let me just do plus 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 minus minus plus minus minus and the same thing here and the matrix looks as follows so you have q here uh, and then you have a, a q here uh, uh, and then you have uh, z minus 1 divided by uh, z minus q to the minus 2 and then q minus q inverse divided by z minus q to the minus 2 and then uh, you get z times q minus q inverse divided by z minus q to the minus 2. And finally, it's going to be z minus 1 uh, divided uh, by z minus q to the minus 2. And zeros here. So this matrix uh, has a pole, as you see, at uh, z equals to q to the minus 2. Uh, and, uh, and also, you can check that it satisfies this condition. Uh, so it also, it, uh, it has, uh, uh, it's also not an isomorphism for z equal to q squared. So it has a, actually a zero there. R bar, yes. Uh, so, so, uh, so what we see is that uh, uh, these are exactly the points where uh, the tensor products were reducible, and that's actually a general fact. Also, uh, it's it's a theorem of 
actually it holds in much more generality. It's a theorem of Frankel and Muhin, uh, which uh, is that uh, if you have an irreducible tensor product, then, uh, so the tensor product is irreducible if and only if uh, our matrices of any uh, pair of factors have no pole at the corresponding point. Where by pole I mean uh, zero or pole. So no, having no pole means that it, it has to be defined and non-degenerate. Yeah, for quantum of fine algebras, yes. So the fact is that uh, V uh, A1 of Z1, V A N of Z N is irreducible if and only if uh, all our matrices are i j bar from v a i of z i cross v a j of z j to itself are defined and invertible. And then we will have an isomorphism from V A I of Z I times V A J of Z J to the product in the opposite direction. Which is just permutation composed with this R bar. Okay, any questions up to this point? And this actually holds in much more generality for high rank algebras. Okay, so uh, now, uh, so what happens uh, for high rank algebras? Uh, well, things get a lot more complicated. Uh, so, for example, you can consider the case SLN. And in, in the SLN case, we still have this uh, evaluation homomorphism, uh, which is defined. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult to define, but not much. Uh, so for uh, UQ of uh, SLN hat, uh, uh, you have uh, still have. Uh, phi z from uq of SLN hat to uq of SLN. But then you have to define uh, where F e0, for example, goes. And it should go to uh, uh, f theta corresponding to the highest root uh, theta. So that's a non-simple root. And so we have to define what this thing is. But it's not very hard. So for example, so for SLN, really, it is going to be, uh, uh, so you, you have the simple uh, generators, fi, which you could call e i uh, i minus 1, uh, uh, which is uh, the elementary matrix, so to speak. And then um, things like, uh, you can define things like e i uh, i uh, minus 2 is a commutator Q commutator, so E i i minus 1, E uh, i minus 1, i minus 2. So the Q commutator, where Q commutator is, uh, uh, is like x, y minus q, y, x. And then you can iterate this procedure to define all the root elements. So for GLN, this procedure works, and it gives you finite. Uh, it gives you an OK result. And then you can define this evaluation homomorphism this way. Uh, uh, and so uh, for every uh, representation of UQ of SLN, uh, let me call it V, we have uh, the pullback uh, phi Z upper star V 
equals to v of z. And so then we can tensor these. Uh, and, uh, but it's not going to be true anymore that any irreducible representation uh, is a, a tensor product. Things uh, get much more complicated. Uh, so it, it's true that any irreducible representation is a quotient of a tensor product. But characters of irreducible representations, even as representations of the usual quantum group, UQ of G, well, for SL2, it was easy because it's just a tensor product, so character is just a product. But here, it's a non-trivial problem. It is solved. But the ultimate understanding of this business only came from the work of Nakajima, who uh, uh, related, uh, who showed that uh, these representations are realized in uh, uh, equivariant uh, uh, K-theory of uh, Nakajima quiver varieties that Andre has been talking about. Uh, so uh, the story is somewhat similar to uh, the work of Kajdan and Lustig, uh, who uh, uh, computed uh, irreducible representations of uh, affine Hickey algebras by realizing uh, these representations in uh, equivalent uh, uh, K-theory of S uh, Springer fibers. Uh, so. Uh, Uh, but we can still parameterize representation. So, uh, so, so we can still ask, how can we at least parameterize representation? This problem usually is much easier uh, because, uh, uh, you know, for example, for category O, it is hard to compute characters, but it is easy to parameterize representation. They are parameterized by highest weights. Uh, now, for other types, for other types, uh, uh, things actually uh, get worse. Uh, so, for example, there is no evaluation homomorphisms. There is no homomorphism from here to here, which restricts to the identity. So, if you have uh, another Lie algebra and you look at ma maps from UQ of G head to UQ of G, just as algebras, uh, such that this diagram is commutative, they don't exist. And the easiest way to show it is, uh, so it's, uh, so Drinfield considered the adjoint representation. So the adjoint representation for other types does not lift to the quantum group, to the quantum affine algebra. So to uh, uh, lift the adjoint representation, you have to add to it a copy of the trivial representation. Then it lifts. And then you can twist it by this tau z and so on. So these evaluation representations are no longer evaluation representations, really. They're just finite dimensional representations. And to quantize a particular irreducible representation of UQ of g, you normally have to add to it a lot of uh, lower weight representations. Uh, this has a geometric meaning in terms of, uh, uh, so if, for example, if you go to Youngians, uh, uh, which is a limit of that, and from K-theory of uh, Nakajima varieties to cohomology, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, so if you want to quantize some representation, uh, V of uh, UQ of G, you want to lift it to uh, uh, UQ of G hat, you cannot do this, so you have to add to it. So let's say it has highest weight lambda. Then you have to add to it uh, sum of uh, some C mu lambda, V mu over mu less than lambda. And there is a minimal way to do it. It's complicated to understand. And the way it arises is if you look at the equivariant uh, cohomology, uh, uh, then uh, there is a top uh, portion uh, which uh, has action uh, which is uh, basically usual cohomology, has action of the, cuts, uh, of the, of the finite dimensional Lie algebra, and then these lower order terms come from the rest. Uh, so that's a complicated phenomenon which was only understood well after this work. Uh, and, uh, but it shows uh, in particular that already in the GLN case, 
we have a question how to parameterize representations. So representations, and usually in representation theory, are parameterized by highest weight. But here we do not have nilpotent action of B plus, and so we do not have highest weight. So, but we really should have highest weight to parameterize. So uh, how could we have a theory of highest weight? Well, uh, uh, maybe uh, so uh, these finite dimensional representations will have highest weights if we consider a different uh, polarization of our Lie algebra, which is called semi-infinite uh, polarization. So, uh, so, so we have this uh, loop algebra of G. Well, this is the affine algebra without the center. We don't care about the center because it acts trivially in finite dimensional representations. Uh, the usual decomposition, the katz mundi decomposition, is this B plus plus H plus B minus, where these are the affine things. So in the SL2 case, you can draw it like this. So you draw these dots. So let's say this is the cartan here. So this is the center. So this is H, this is uh, F, and this is E. And this is like ET, HT, FT. And this is like ET inverse, HT inverse, FT inverse. Uh, uh, let me draw this with a different color. And so, uh, so this decomposition should say right n plus, n plus. So this uh, standard Katz-Moody decomposition looks like this. So uh, uh, there is one. Uh, so the. So this is n plus. And then. This is n minus. But uh, for finite dimensional representations. We don't have a nilpotent action of this thing because this both involves E's and F's. But we will have nilpotent action of this half if we cut it this way. So if we cut it this way, then uh, it's more compatible with the loop structure. So basically, we cut the finite dimensional algebra and then just tensor it with the loops. And then what are we going to have? So we are going to have uh, this uh, n plus tilde, let me call it. This is going to be n minus tilde, and this is going to be h tilde. So we will have an infinite dimensional Cartan. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, you have a highest weight theory with respect to, uh, to this. Except that highest weights now will be infinite sequences, or uh, you can use generating function, a power series, uh, which will encode eigenvalues of all these infinitely many things. Well, it's, it's quite simple in the uh, classical case, and in fact, you can. Uh, say what highest weight each representation that I defined last time has. So we will get some, we will get some polynomials if you write the generating functions. But, uh, um, and that's a pretty easy exercise. But what is not completely clear is why is it when we do Q deform, we will still have an algebra like this. Because of course, uh, these elements deform in a rather complicated way. In the usual presentation of the quantum group, we only know how to deform uh, the basic generators. And these are obtained by, uh, it, you know, from them uh, by writing products with many terms. So, uh, so why are we going to have a nice uh, commutative subalgebra like that? And that was a great discovery of Drinfeld, which is the D Drinfeld new realization, uh, which allowed him to develop a theory of finite dimensional representations in general by attaching to such representations highest weights with respect to this infinite uh, Cartan subalgebra. So he showed that there exists this uh, infinite Cartan subalgebra. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, uh, that's right. But uh, it's, uh, you know, Baxter only considered the, you know, G GL2 or GLN. Huh? No, definitely, Drinfeld, uh, uh, definitely there, there were works uh, by physicists which uh, uh, had all these structures. But uh, uh, so Drinfeld wrote uh, in his uh, uh, paper uh, the, the general treatment for any finite dimensional Lie algebra. Uh, so uh, let's see. 
probably I, uh, I should stop and we will uh, uh, discuss this tomorrow. Sorry. So actually, maybe is there a geometric explanation in terms of quiver varieties of this uh, phenomenon? Because these lower order terms correspond to uh, uh, other grade degrees of uh, homology, equivalent homology. So I don't know. The, the, the maybe it has to do with the geometry of these varieties for other types. Do, uh, huh? Yeah. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Ah, okay. Huh? Is 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 that why it has? Well, it may be a reason. Uh huh. But I mean, they don't really distinguish distinguish the type H or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's but but it's an interesting phenomenon, and uh, it, it would be nice to to have a good explanation. Yeah. I mean, I don't know an algebraic explanation. I don't know. Yeah, uh, w w well, I mean, there is a, uh, you, you mean the shift by Q squared? Y yeah, so the, there is a, uh, uh, well, multiplication by Q to the fourth is a double dual. And you want, uh, say, Q, ah, Q squared? Uh, you want well, Well, in fact, in fact, it is the same if I multiply parameters by anything simultaneously, not just by Q squared. <laughs> and that's because we have uh, one parameter, uh, uh, a C star action, which, yeah, C star action, which I mentioned. How, is it easy to see? Uh, um, uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, it's uh, that's right. The, the, yes, there is. So, uh, so, so there is this universal R matrix, uh, and uh, if you write it with the Katz derivation, it's going to look like this: Q to the C tensor D plus D tensor C uh, plus sum of uh, X I tensor X I, where this is a basis of Cartan, and then one plus uh, high order terms, which is in the usual uh, thing. And then uh, there is this Drinfield element U, which is, uh, uh, so, uh, so you take antipode uh, of uh, uh, one tensor antipode of R, and then you have to multiply in the opposite order. Uh, so, uh, so in other words, if R equals to the sum of A I tensor with B I, then uh, U is the sum of antipode of B I times A I. And now, uh, uh, so uh, this element uh, implements uh, uh, the uh, squared antipode. So uh, U uh, X uh, U inverse is S squared of X. Uh, but what happens is, uh, uh, so there is a, uh, there is a shift by rho that appears, which gives you this, uh, 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 actually, actually it's, it's, uh, it's easier than that. So, uh, you, you just have in the finite dimensional case, so in, in the general katz moody case, the antipode squared is the inner atomorphism uh, uh, given by q to the two rho check, uh, rho hat, where this is uh, two, two rho, which is uh, this rho is an uh, element of Cartan whose uh, inner product with all fundamental weights is one. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, adjoint of q to the 2 rho. But then, uh, uh, well, the, uh, so for a fine case, this rho is equal to uh, the usual rho, finite dimensional rho, plus uh, dual Coxton number uh, times uh, uh, the Katz derivation. So this does not really act in finite dimensional representations. And therefore, this automorphism becomes outer. So the part, so q to the 2 rho is q to the 2 rho bar times q to the 2 h check d. And so this is inner automorphism, but this is outer automorphism, which is exactly shifted by 2 h check. OK, other questions? OK, so let's uh, finish tomorrow. So tomorrow I will continue and hopefully get the two characters.